we're very privileged today to have Jane Fraser, the CEO of Citi, uh, with us. And we're going to have a conversation about what's going on in the financial world, among other things. And, uh, but just to introduce her very briefly, we'll talk about her bio during the, the, the discussion. Uh, she is from Scotland, Edinburgh, uh, did her undergraduate degree and got her master's at Cambridge, uh, later went to Harvard Business School. She started her career, I guess you could say, at uh, Goldman Sachs. Indeed. And then later went to Spain for a few years, then went to Harvard Business School, and then joined McKinsey, where she became a partner. And then after doing that for a while, she joined Citi, and she had successive positions there as the CEO of its private bank, the CEO of its Latin American business, the CEO of its consumer and commercial uh, mortgage business, and she also had the position of being the CEO of its global consumer bank, and later, two years ago this month, became the uh, CEO, the first woman to be the head of a major commercial bank in the United States. So, um, anything new in the banking world? <laughs> It's been, a, it's been a quiet week, quiet, okay. quiet week David. So, but, uh, um, so let's talk about uh, what has been going on. Yeah. Let's start with the easy ones, mm -hmm. uh, Silicon Valley Bank. What went <laughs> wrong there? <laughs> well, before we dive into that, um, I've worked in financial markets all around the world. Uh, and I have to say we're very lucky in America. This is the best financial system in the world. It is the envy of the world. OK. But despite and, it being the best, we have some problems from time to time. Yeah, but they're, they're isolated problems. So if when, you, when you look at it, the financial system is broad, it's deep here, it's competitive. We've got some large banks that are well capitalized um, and a source of strength at the moment. We have medium-sized banks, regional banks, and by and large, they are equally well capitalized, serving their communities, play an important part in the banking system. This is quite isolated. Okay, but people are still interested in hearing about it, so, um, so uh, your bank is well capitalized. Your yes. bank, I should have said, is a bank with about 230,000 employees yep. and about an $85 billion market capitalization. Yep. So uh, your bank is in good shape, and your, your bank is the fourth biggest bank in the United States, is that yep. right? J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and then Citi. There is a bank on the West Coast called Silicon Valley Bank, or there yes. was a bank there. <laughs> not as well capitalized. Yes. I mean, did the regulators not understand what was going on, or the people in the banking world, people like you, were you surprised by what happened? Uh, you, so you had a combination of two pieces. You've had the macro and some idiosyncratic and, um, factors around Silicon Valley Bank, but then you also had the impact accelerated by social media of what went down. So we've had the, we knew that when we got weaned off lower for longer rates, it was gonna be pretty painful. Um, and the rates curve and the increase in rates has been most we've seen the fastest and the steepest in 40 years. So there's a bit of pain that comes from that. Secondly, um, you did have idiosyncratic factors, I think is the polite British way of describing them in Silicon Valley Bank. So as all this played out, you saw some pretty serious holes in their balance sheet management and they had a very concentrated client base. Um, and that client base ended up burning cash much faster than anticipated. Um, and the, uh, they ended up wanting to raise capital and it went down pretty quick. Well, do you think the Federal Reserve recognized mm -hmm. that some banks would be really hurt by higher interest rates in a way that Silicon Valley was hurt? Or do you think the Fed was more focused on fighting inflation and didn't worry about the impact on the banks? I think the, the Fed's job number one is fighting inflation and we want the Fed to be very dependable in fighting inflation and that should be, that should be their most important priority. There are ramifications of it, um, but there are certain banks, which I'd say are, are an isolated few that have really been impacted very negatively that didn't necessarily manage their balance sheets that well in retrospect. All right, in the Great Recession in 07, 08 or so, the US government passed TARP legislation, and under the TARP legislation, uh, large amounts of capital were injected into banks, including Citi. Indeed. Um, some banks said they didn't need it, but everybody took it who was operated or forced to take it. Uh, and effectively, that meant that the sh shareholders, the creditors, and the depositors were all protected. Mm -hmm. This time around, Silicon Valley Bank was, uh, only the depositors were protected, over a decision made by the Biden administration and others over the weekend. 
Do you think that was the right decision to protect only the depositors and say goodbye to the shareholders and goodbye to the creditors? I think it, it's, it's very important to protect the depositors. Right now, the banking system um, everywhere around the world depends on confidence, and that confidence has to be in the safety and security of deposits. So in terms of the, the most important job here, they did the most important job, which is making sure the depositors were whole. So in the old days, uh, you, when there were bank runs, you used to see people lined up outside yeah. the street and get their money out. Now, you're just on your iPhone or whatever phone you have, you can take your money out. So yeah. money moves so quickly. Yeah. Uh, was that a factor as well in having the money get out of a bank so quickly? You don't have to wait in line. You can just do it over the uh, it, iPhone? It's a complete game changer from what we've seen before, David. You're absolutely right. Um, there were a couple of tweets, um, and then this thing, this thing went down much faster than has happened in history. And frankly, I think the regulators did a good job in responding very quickly um, because normally you have longer um, to respond to this. So they, they acted with uh, quite a lot of speed given how quickly this happened. So some people say you have a moral hazard when you, when you protect people. So by protecting all the depositors in Silicon Valley Bank, the implication was that if somebody else has a problem, we'll protect them and so forth. And so the $250,000 limit is meaningless, more or less. Uh, or do you think mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve and the uh, Secretary of Treasury are saying we're not going to protect every depositor or we're going to protect certain depositors? Uh, I don't think they need to go out right now because the banking system is pretty sound and, and we're talking about a few banks. Right. We heard it from the Chairman Powell today. Um, you know, this is not something that is spread across the entire banking system. This isn't like it was last time. This is not a credit crisis. Um, this is a situation where it's a few banks um, that have some problems, and it's better to make sure that we nip that in the bud. Okay, so what about the, uh, the problem that uh, over the weekend, when this was being debated within the administration, people didn't know if they were gonna protect depositors, uh, mm -hmm. shareholders, creditors. They decided to protect depositors, but they obviously were trying to get some bank to buy Silicon Valley Bank. Why do you think nobody emerged to willing, to, willing to buy it? Um, normally it takes you a few days to get your arms around these. You know, historically, if there was a, a bank that had problems, you had at least a week where people were looking at it. Because of what you said before in terms of the digital side, this happened very quickly. Um, so we'll wait and see if something, uh, if we do see a buyer in the next few days emerge. We hope okay. so. Not to pick on the West Coast, but there's another West Coast bank, yeah. uh, First Republic Bank, which yeah. is around the country, but based in San Francisco. And they've had some problems. They've had gigantic decline in their market value and so forth. Uh, do you expect that somebody will bail them out or buy them? Well, I'm not going to comment in depth on First Republic because they are actively working through the challenges that they're facing right now. Um, you're, what you saw, last week was a number of the large banks, 11 of us, got together to put uh, a large capital uh, or deposit injection into them to help buy the time right. to make sure that they could come up with a, a, the right solution for the restructuring that's right. needed. So the large yeah. banks and others put in roughly $30 billion of deposits. Yeah. I think you put in roughly $5 billion or yeah. something like that. So um, how did that happen? Did Jamie Dimon call you up and say, hey, you have $5 billion you don't really need and you can put it in uh, First Republic? And is it you have to go to your board to say, I need to get $5 billion somewhere? I mean, how, how, how do you make that decision? And was it yeah. you just say to Jamie, I'll call you back, I'll think about it? Or how, did, how, did, how does that work? So um, you, one of the great things about this was actually that the banks did all come back together, because you think of it, we're, we're all pretty, we usually try and kill each other in different deals that we're trying to do. I mean, it's, right. you, 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 don't, you don't want to have um, someone else win a pitch over yourselves, so there's a lot of competition between us. But in this instance, this is one where yeah, we're in a strong position, we want to stop what could have been you know, a problem, and we all know when there is a confidence crisis, the logic that takes over isn't it necessarily yeah. rational? So we wanted to go and help protect the system. It's in the interest to do so. So despite this being quite a divisive environment that we're all operating in, this is an instance of the banks coming together and saying, OK, what can we do here to support right. a system that we have confidence in? And you don't put $5 billion into the system um, through the generosity of your own heart. You do it because you have confidence in the system okay. itself. Um, you expect to get that money back eventually? Yes. Okay. 
So uh, Jamie Dimon is a great banker. I think he's been the head of uh, J.P. Morgan for 17 years, something hey. like that. Jamie Dimon. <laughs> um, well regarded. But um, why do you think it is the case that he's calling around and doing this and not the Secretary of Treasury, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, the head of the FDIC? Why is it a non-government person is doing this? I would have thought a government person would do this. David, why do you think that Janet wasn't calling around doing it? Do well, you believe everything you read in the newspapers well, on these rooms? Um, because when people in Washington do something good, they usually have the press know yeah. about it. So, uh, <laughs> um, But maybe she was calling around. I'm sure she was. But yeah, yeah. Jamie seems to be getting all the credit, if credit is the right word, or is that not fair to give him the credit? Oh, I, Jamie played a role. I think we all played a role, and so okay. did. It was a very active discussion over that weekend okay. and over the week with a number of members. It, all right. there's, there's a lot of engagement. There's, I think people should take confidence in this. There's really good engagement. There's brainstorming, and there's a good intent here of how do we come together and try and give some support into something that we believe in. It's a it's, good thing. Would City consider buying First Republic, or you're not interested? No. In, no, you're not buying. Okay. Um, another bank uh, <laughs> called Credit Suisse. Yes. Credit Suisse seemed to dissolve very, very quickly. Uh, were you surprised at, at how quickly that bank kind of went away after about 100 years of being around? So the nice thing is we're talking about three or four banks out of the thousands that are here in the States and the rest of it. So let's put that in perspective. So Credit Suisse, I don't think anyone was falling off their chair that Credit Suisse um, ultimately ended up where it did. It was really a question of time. It's been a troubled institution for a long time. Those of you who don't know it, it's a very um, global bank. In Switz it's got a very strong operation in Switzerland, good wealth management in Asia, an investment bank here in the States um, and around the world, but it's had a lot of issues. Um, it's had a lot of management instability. It's had a, a number of different um, crises and things that have hit it. So no one was hugely surprised that this happened. It was really a question of time in everyone's yeah. mind. One issue that seems very unusual there is that when Credit Suisse was taken over by UBS, uh, they in effect protected to some extent the shareholders. They didn't wipe out the shareholders of Credit Suisse. They got $2 billion or something like that. 2 billion euros, perhaps, or Swiss francs in, in compensation, smaller than the value had been before. But the bondholders who, issued, who held a certain kind of bond, they were wiped out. Normally, bondholders get protected yeah. before the shareholders. Why did that happen? Um, it's an anomaly in Switzerland, and we were very happy to see the Europeans come out very quickly, and, say, and the UK as well, saying that's not how, they, that's not how the system works. Under it. So it was, it was truly just a Swiss Piece. And I think all of us were quite relieved when that clarification came, came out, as it obviously took people by surprise. Okay. But, so, but let's also look at this. This was a very orderly process. You know, this is a major global bank with operations everywhere. And here again, the, the, this was done extremely well over a okay. few days. Um, because we were quite worried about what would happen on Monday morning. Was there going to be complete chaos? And there wasn't. Well, Credit Suisse has some great private bankers, and they yep. have some great clients. Uh, are the city bankers calling up the Credit Suisse former employees and saying you should come here now or something like no, that? No, I think they're calling us. They are. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So um, as we talk today, uh, the Federal Reserve has announced that it's going to increase uh, the federal discount rate by another 25 mm -hmm. basis points, which was mm -hmm. probably not a surprise yeah. to the market. Uh, do you think that was the right decision, though? Look, it, it, I think it was a tough decision. Was Jay going to pause? Was he going to um, increase it by the 25 bips or more? Um, I think what he said was, frankly, jolly sensible, if you'll pardon the British expression. Um, I do that occasionally. Um, he, he said, we don't know how much credit tightening is going to come from what's gone on in the last couple of weeks. We don't quite know what's going to happen there. So, but we do know that inflation is a real problem. It's persistent. It's starting to come off. But he has to tackle this. And in, in Jay, the markets trust, and many of us do, because you know, he has been so clear about slaying the inflation dragon. But he's going to wait and see what the data shows as to what the impact of the next, you know, the last couple of weeks have been. That, that feels like a very sensible response. He also, so, you know, let, let's tackle this and make sure everyone's quite clear that they're going to tackle inflation hard. 
but let's also see what the data is and, and adjust accordingly. Oh, he has said consistently, I want to get inflation back to yep. 2%, where it roughly was for 25 years. Yeah. But some people say 2% is kind of low. It will produce uh, unemployment up to 6% and maybe guarantee a recession. Do you think 2% is too low? What about 3% as inflation goal? Look, as we look longer, as we look out longer term in the world, there's a number of different things that are probably more inflationary in nature we've got to tackle. If we're going to look at um, you know, moving to greener, a greener economy, that's more inflationary. If we're going to be looking at building in much more resiliency into supply chains, you know, that adds some cost to the systems. So, you know, two percent is going to be quite hard when we think in the longer run about some of these trends that need to be taken into account. It's not impossible, but it's um, it could be difficult. Um, do Jay Power ever call you up for your advice? Does he call you, or do you call him, or you talk to him lately, or to Janet Yellen? Do they call you? And you're the running running one of the biggest I, banks. Yes, they yeah, do. They do call. And what do they, they say? They call. You know, they 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 will ask for opinions on things. So it, it, I think it's it's great to see that we've got people that aren't just telling you what to do, or just they're soliciting advice, trying to understand what's happening in the economy. What are we seeing? What are we learning? Because we're a big global bank. We've got operations everywhere. We have a lot of information on it. So they'll be testing out what they Thank see going on. They'll be asking for advice. They won't necessarily take it, but so I'm used to that. I'm a mother of teenagers. If you're in a, <laughs> if you're in a board meeting or something like that, um, does your assistant tell you uh, that there's a call from the Secretary uh, Treasury or Chairman of the Federal Reserve, where they put that right through, or do you say, I'll get back to them when I'm Oh, done? I, 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 I my right chairman away. sitting in front of me here, you can attest that I will dump the board to pick up Janet okay, Yellen okay. or Jay Powell. <laughs> so um, do you see any evidence in the uh, information and data that City has that we are heading for a recession, a mild recession or some type of recession? If yeah. so, when might you think we would see the evidence of that? Yeah, I mean, we, we've certainly been expecting that a, a recession could well be could well be happening in the second half of the year. If one does occur, um, we don't think it'll be that heavy and that hard a recession, because normally when you're heading into uh, some tougher times, you know the consumers not in such good health. The, the, the companies aren't, the banks aren't. Whereas that's not the case right now. The consumer is in good health. Um, the corporate balance sheets are strong. People took advantage of a low rate environment to make sure their balance sheets are in good shape. And the banks are strong. So the factors that typically amplify a recession are not in, the, are not in play at the moment. So um, you know, we have to make sure there's nothing crazy happens in the geopolitical world that would change it. But we could well have a mild recession. The last couple of weeks could make that a bit more likely between price stability and financial stability. But it it's, doesn't feel like it's going to be a tough one. And the U.S. economy is likely to pull out of it pretty quickly. As we talk today, are you worried about any other bank without mentioning one uh, that might have a financial problem? Or you think that there's another shoe to drop? Or you think we're basically patched this problem up by now? Look, I think there's, a, there's probably going to be a few. There could well be some smaller institutions um, that have similar issues in terms of they've been caught um, without managing the balance sheets um, as ably as others have done. And it's quite likely there may be a few of them. Um, we, we, um, we certainly hope there'll be fewer rather than more. But then again, it should be manageable within the existing toolkit that's there. Okay, let's talk about your background for a moment. Yeah. So you grew up in Edinburgh area? Yep, I did. And were your parents bankers? No, definitely not. So oh. my father was a, a Scottish accountant which meant you, you, you're not really relying on parental generosity and extra pocket money um, from a Scottish accountant as a father. So uh, I used to earn my pocket money on the golf course at St Andrews caddying. You would not know it from my golf game. but So, uh, so you was, were a good golfer or you were a caddy? Or? I was a caddy. You wouldn't think I was a golfer if you saw my golf game now, but I used to enjoy it a lot. Well, I'm sure it's better than mine. But um, So um, you grew up and you were an only child. Yep. So... Um, I'm an only child too, so there's an advantage so to that. So we're both maybe. special, David. Um, there's pluses and minuses, but uh, <laughs> all right. So you're growing up. What did you say you wanted to be? The CEO of City when you were growing up. What did you think you wanted oh, to be? Oh, I wanted to be a doctor when I grew up, but I was really lousy at biology, so that kind oh. of new, that, that one that ended happens quickly. a lot to people who yes. want to go to medical school. So <laughs> yeah. okay, so you went to Cambridge. Was yeah. it hard to get into Cambridge? Pretty good school. And uh, how did you know, how did you get in? Were you to take exams and 
Well, do, you, do you get scholarships? How do you go to Cambridge? Uh, so I, my parents, when I was 12, moved to Australia, um, which I thought I died and gone to heaven because the climate difference was quite material between the two. And I applied to Cambridge from Australia, and I think they probably thought I was such an unusual person in terms of background. They uh, managed to walk, talk my way in there, David. All right, so you got in, and how did yes. you do there? You liked it, and what did you study? Uh, I studied economics. Um, and in those days, um, it, it's, a, it's a stun. I mean, what a privilege to go there. It's the most beautiful place to go and study. Um, um, and um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite inspiring. It is, it's a wonderful university. I know you have many affiliations with US ones, but that, that place is special. Um, and the only thing that you had in the economics department there is it was mainly by extreme left wing communists who were the, um, the professors there. So they have not proven to be that helpful um, when it oh, came to, okay. uh, and, and they were usually very depressed because all of us who'd studied economics and they thought they converted them to their way of thinking, we all then worked, went and got applied for jobs in the city of London and turned into capitalists oh, and disappointed wow. them enormously. All right. so. Um, <laughs> After you graduated, what did you do? After I graduated, I joined Goldman as an analyst. Um, and, and that's an easy job to get, <laughs> and an easy job when you have it. You don't work more than 30, 40 hours a week. Yes, like yeah, yes. So how many years did you do that? So I worked at Goldman for a couple of years. And I was, I was young when I started, and everyone was, I was a boring girl from Scotland. Everyone else was European, spoke multiple languages, and was a lot more exotic and interesting than me. So after I finished the Annas program, I thought I'd better make myself a bit more interesting. So I moved to Spain. And and, did you uh, speak Spanish before? I didn't. You didn't? So I didn't speak Spanish how before. How did you think you were going to get through that? Um, because, you know, you can, in those days when you're 22 and you right. just turn up and you go and do a crash course in Spanish for three All weeks. Right, so and now you speak Spanish. Si, sí, hablo español perfectamente. Right. <laughs> ¿Qué tal su español? Well, my, I, I know one word, maybe C si or something like that. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, I, uh, I okay. thought it was certeza. Yes. So I, I, you know, my language skills are very limited. So, uh, so luckily, after, luckily you, have, you have other talents, though, well, which is a full Spanish thing, isn't then. one of them. But all right, so, all right, so you do there for a couple of years, and then you decide to go where? To America. All right, and where yes. did you want to go in America? So I, um, I did the same again. Taught my way into Harvard Business School. Um, and I was fascinated by the American machine. And if you've spent a bit of time in Europe and grown up in the, you know, the 80s, 70s and 80s, so it's you, fascinating. To, America is just uh, you know, something you want to try and understand and the American economy and the American entrepreneurs, not someone you ever want to bet against. So when you went to Harvard Business School, you entered in 92, something like yes, that? Yes, that's right. right. You entered in 92. Uh, were there a lot of women in your class then? Uh, probably about 24, 25%, something like okay. that. Yes. And, uh, there were enough of us to cause trouble. You graduated in 94. Yes. And who became the most famous person in your class other than you? Uh, there's, a, there's quite a few people who uh, right. who've done some pretty extraordinary things in my, um, in my the, class. The Someone governor, you know quite well, the governor, the governor of, of Virginia, 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 for class. example. Okay. Yes. Um, so who was a better student, you or Oh, no, Glenn, Glenn was definitely better. Really? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. All right, so um, all right, you graduate from Harvard Business School, and then you decide to go to <clears throat> McKinsey? Yes, I did. And why did you want to be a consultant? Uh, well, first of all, was why didn't, why didn't I go back into banking at that time? And I'd been in banking in the 80s, where there weren't many women in banking, unlike the business school. Um, they wore suits with very big shoulder pads. Um, and they were more scary than the men. Um, <laughs> you, remember the, you remember the era. And so uh, when I looked at the consulting, uh, particularly McKinsey, I like partnerships. I think partnerships are great places to grow up. The apprenticeship model is wonderful. Uh, global institution and firm. Um, and also it was, you know, it was quite strategic um, in what they were looking at. It was similar issues to M&A at Goldman. Um, but I thought yeah. I would have a chance of having a family a bit more predictability um, okay. in the work schedule. So you did it for 10 years, roughly? 10 years, yeah. And you had two children during that time? Yeah. Yeah. And they're now in college? They are in college, yes. Um, one at, I can't say where they, they go yeah, to school. They, one can. is at Duke, uh, yes. uh, happy to say, and one is at Stanford. But yes. did you tell them it'd be easier for you if they were closer to each other <laughs> on the campus? I mean, I've, I've, they fired me as a parent, and I'm only hired as a part-time consultant on okay. occasion. Okay. <laughs> 
All right, so you, uh, you go to McKinsey, you work your way up, you become a partner there. Yeah. And you know, being a partner at McKinsey is a great job. Why did you decide to leave to go to City? Yeah. So when I was, I became a mum at the same time as I became a partner, and I was a, I worked part time um, all the way through my partnership years, um, and McKinsey was fantastic about that because they, I, you know, was able to spend time with the with kids before they went into school. But then when they got, when they were then at school, that I felt like okay, I can go back um, full time working again, and. I, you know, I honestly, I felt like it was time that I could prove that I would, I could do it rather than just advise. Um, okay, and so, so I thought it was time to, you know, okay, go and see if you can put your, um, you know, do, do see if I could actually all right, so translate you, you, my words and advice into action. All right, so you went to City. At the time, um, did you think a woman could become or would ever become the head of City? I honestly never thought about it. it, it, it I mean, at that point, it, it's a firm that there were quite a few women around in. I've been in an environment that was always very supportive around it, some fantastic male mentors and others. And it wasn't, it was just never something I thought about. This was 20 years ago. So um, I was just enjoying the day job. So you had a series of jobs, everyone, you were the CEO of this division or that division and so forth. And one time yeah. they asked you to move to Latin America uh, to yeah. be the CEO of Latin America. Did you think that was a dead end? You're gonna to move to Latin America, get out of the way of the succession? Or did you think that was a way to get promoted? Um, it was a big turnaround role, and it's one of those ones you say, if I did a good job, then you know, that was going to put me in good position for bigger, bigger opportunities okay. ahead. And if I did a bad job, then you know, so oh, be it. You wouldn't, you weren't afraid they would forget you. You're down in Brazil or something, and you, you weren't afraid they would forget you and everything like that. No. Okay. So you did a good job. You come back, and you're the head of the Global Consumer Bank. What is yes. the Global Consumer Bank at City? So that's, um, that's retail banking, that's a credit card, which I believe you are a proud owner of a city credit card, David. I, I am, I yeah, do have so that here. I, uh, I can't, I'm getting, uh, I don't have enough frequent flyer miles on it though. I'm, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to, you told me I'm not qualified for my frequent flyer miles, but. Yeah, you got the wrong card. Is it a, yeah, yeah. Uh, is, it a is this the best credit card you can get? Um, the, um, so, he, 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 David, you have the one with our wonderful partner, American Airlines, and how, they, 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 it's a I, you, have, you have one, but yours is black. How come mine's yes. gold? How come I don't have? Which yeah, yeah. is better? You've got to ask for it, David. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Well, I, 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 although I suspect you may not be flying quite as much on the commercial airlines. Yeah, so. I've, never, uh, I've, uh, I've done. Uh, <laughs> Probably uh, not as much as I used to, I would say, but okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so all right, you're, all right, when did you realize for the first time I could be, or you could be the CEO of the, of the bank? I mean, you know, there are a lot of people, you have 230,000 employees, a lot of them want to be CEO. When did you realize for the first time you, you had a chance to get that? Um, when I was made president of the bank. Um, because up until then, you just you don't really have a sense. Um, okay. But that was the point when um, Mike and John had a conversation about um, okay. being a likely successor, but no guarantees in life, and I better do a good job. Okay, yes. so your predecessor was Michael Corbett. Yeah. Um, he retired about two years ago. Yep. You succeeded him. What was the biggest challenge you had in becoming the CEO right away? Oh, it was COVID. Um, so this was becoming CEO during COVID is not the easiest because you know, one's used to going around, going to different sites, seeing our people, seeing our clients in person. And while Zoom did an amazing job, it is not the same. What? And so I, you, know, you have to learn how to lead in a different way. Well, where, did, where were you working? Were you working out of your home or did you come in because you're the CEO? Um, I came in. I came into the office and worked from there. Right. I think if my husband would have... I've not been too thrilled if I was home all of the time, if I'm also okay. honest. Um, and your husband was a former Goldman banker? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. right. So uh, he understands finance, and do you ever consult with him and say, I got this problem at City, what do you think? Um, he hears quite a few different things going on, and he's, you know, he's a wonderful asset to have because he, he understands what you're going through, and you know, these jobs are ones where having someone who's supportive of you makes a huge difference. So, so he's been wonderful. The finance? My kids, my kids not so interested. They're not yes. interested in finance. No, no. Okay, well, they'll learn eventually that it's more, you know, yeah, a better we're, thing to do. Maybe they'll go into them. something important like private equity, too. Uh, um, <laughs> no, maybe one day private equity have a woman running it. I, yes. Maybe. <laughs> Um, 
Uh, at the rate we're going, it'll take a while probably. I haven't seen that many uh, uh, firms that are moving in that direction, but they're trying and yeah, we're yeah. trying, but it's, uh, we're not as, as far ahead as the, con as the commercial banks yet probably. Yeah. So let me ask They'll you, yeah. when you're doing COVID and you have to deal yes. with that, everybody's working at home. When COVID is over, the theory was that people were gonna come back to work, yeah. but the large financial service firms in New York, in including mine, um, seem to have very few people coming in five days a week. Uh, what is your policy on that? Yeah, uh, very early on, uh, we realized that for a lot of people, um, the working from home was actually quite effective. Um, and we also had a view that COVID was going to go on for a while. We'd, we'd been in Asia for a hundred and odd years. We, you know, we'd seen what happened to SARS. It, these things take a while to get over. So we knew that this was going to be around for a while and that anyone speaking to any of their people who've got young kids homeschooling is, you know, that, that was a nightmare for parents. It was so hard. Commuting, folk were worried about it. So we, you know, we were very well aware of, from our people that we were going to have to be flexible in the approach. And the flexibility was actually not hurting productivity in a lot of different areas. So we made a call quite early on to say that you are definitely, we're, bet we're better together but that doesn't mean to say that it has to be all the time. Um, and so we laid out the reasons why we wanted people together. It was around apprenticeship, it would be around collaboration. Um, but think of Wall Street. Wall Street in the 80s when I grew up, you know, you're doing all-nighters, you're doing, the, the culture's changed. You don't need to have quite such that, um, you just don't need that culture anymore. So we're encouraging our analysts to go home in the evenings. If they need to work, work from home. You don't have to be in the office to do it. Um, if you've got some folk that have significant commutes, um, you know, giving them a break so they can work from home actually makes them more productive. So we're thoughtful about it. It's not one size fits all. Um, our traders are in five days a week, um, but you know, we found that the hybrid model actually but you're brings in five out the days, best. You're in five days a week. I'm traveling a lot, okay. so I'm so not actually in that. You're not in, in five, but you're working often. five days a week, not in, from your home. Yeah, pretty sometimes much. a bit more than that. Okay, more than that. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> Today, um, Citi is a bank that has announced it's changing its strategy. Yes. And you now want to be a consumer and, and institutional biz bank in the United States. Is that right? Um, and, yeah. and you're getting out of the consumer business outside yeah. of the United States. So what we've said we are, rather than what we're not, okay. is a, you know, it, it's a pretty extraordinary bank in its history. Um, and in its presence globally. It's uniquely operate, opens the door as a bank in 100 different countries. So the, the city is to be the preeminent banking partner for companies and for investors and for individuals with cross-border needs. Um, and that's the vision of the bank. That's the, we will serve that client base um, as their absolutely critical partner. Okay, so you've sold a number of your international mm -hmm. consumer businesses and yes, you've announced you're trying to sell uh, your business in, in uh, Mexico. The consumer business. Consumer there. business. Yes. Um, who are you going to sell that to? Oh, <laughs> we've been we've been fortunate to have a lot of interest there. Look, we looked at we looked at consumer banking, <clears throat> and we could see that originally the the view had been that you would get a lot of global scale in consumer banking, and okay. we were very strong in a number of different geographies. But the reality is you don't get as much scale globally. Um, it's much more about local scale in those businesses. So we decided, let's focus. We want the bank to be simple. We want to be truly excellent at what we do. And that's better right. if you're a more focused bank around fewer business lines. So that's, All right. that's the path we're on. So after the Great Recession, um, yes. your bank did a 10 for 1 reverse split. Yep. And the stock, uh, which was then maybe 5 or 6 or something, uh, became worth 50 or 60. I forget what it was, something like that but you're still around 60 or so, something like that, maybe in the high 50s. So the bank stock under your predecessors and to some extent are new hasn't really moved in mm. 10 years. Is that a concern? Well, we're transforming the bank to make sure that we're in a very different position. So the, we're changing the strategy of the bank as we talked okay. about, and that entails selling 65,000 employees. It's 25% of our employee base. So we can really focus and double down on okay. the businesses that make sense. But the, of um, the 230,000 yeah. you have, you're mm -hmm. selling 65,000 of yes. them? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes, it's a lot. 
And I think you know, it's under the belief that what, where, we, where we truly excel, we will move every single day $4 trillion of volume for 5,000 multinational firms. You know, there's no other bank in the world that can do that. Um, so we'll be helping them with their payroll, with all of their suppliers, with their pay, well, all the payments that they're making in the system, with their foreign exchange, with their trade. It's an extraordinary network everywhere around yeah. the world that does that. That's, a, that's an incredible asset for America. It's a strategic asset for the states um, because you'd much rather have American companies operating on American banking rails and not foreign banking rails, particularly these days. So that's what we're focusing the bank around, is that client base. Um, and it's a big transformation, Thanks. David, right? This is bold. Um, you know, this takes some courage to do. We're making really good progress on it. And we're putting a lot of investment into modernizing the bank because we've had um, some regulatory orders against us as well to make sure that we make the investments we need to and making sure the culture is there of real excellence, um, but also to be a human bank. We've talked about that being important. All, put all of that together, that's a lot of transformation. It's a lot of work, but we're really, we're determined around it and we're completely convinced that that puts the bank into a different profitability, different return profile, and ultimately to the benefit of our shareholders. Now, under your predecessors, uh, the re U.S. regulators weren't so happy from time to time about yeah. your regulatory controls that you had over uh, your business. Um, is that one of your biggest concerns, making the regulators feel happier about what you're doing? Oh, I mean, one, if you're a bank, you do want to make sure that regulators feel that you are safe, sound, okay. and that you're operating appropriately. I found them to be very constructive and very helpful. Um, our regulators give us good advice because, you know, like, like every company these days, everyone is trying to transform because of digitization. They, they have an insight into all the banks in the system. And frankly, they give us some, um, you know, they're, they're tough, um, but they give us very good guidance and advice as to the, they, they, want, they want the banking system to be strong, sound, and incredibly effective. And I have to say, um, it's been, a, I've had a lot of good guidance from them. They've been helpful. So when you, you're in Washington today as we talk, and when yeah. people come to Washington, they often talk to members of Congress. Yep. Um, do you always find that an uplifting experience? <laughs> In the congressional hearings, less so, I have to say. I've had four congressional hearings so oh. far with, um, with my fellow bank CEOs, and um, those, one, those ones are a little tougher. The questions um, are always fair? <laughs> they aren't always questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, today, um, the culture of any organization is critical. Mm -hmm. So what type of culture are you trying to infuse into City? It's had many CEOs over the last 10 years or four or five different people, so the culture has changed a fair bit. What culture are you trying to in infuse into the organization? Yeah. I, um, the culture we're infusing is one of excellence, but also one of empathy. And it's not a word, some people start cringing when they hear that, but I actually think empathy is a critical source of competitive advantage, because that means that you're actually listening to your clients and your customers and understanding what they're worried about. You're in touch with your people, and understanding what it is that they, they care about and why they want to work or what they're looking for. And then you put your value proposition around it and unsurprisingly that gives you competitive edge. So, so I'm looking for a bank that has a human side to it as well as a bank that has a brain and is very, very good at what they do. So 230,000 employees, you'll yeah. have fewer at some point when you, you do the divestors, but how do you communicate uh, with 230,000 people? Would you send them emails from time to time or you yeah. do a Zoom call? What do you do? Yeah, um, a, a lot of different pieces. And actually, it's one of the things that it, it's the most fun piece is communicating and talking to your people, right? It just is one of those great sources of energy. It's wonderful traveling around the world now. So going around listening and talking to them in person is wonderful. When I first started in COVID, every Thursday night, um, I would write a note um, just letting everyone know what was going on because it was so important to feel you were connected to something. We we're, all, we're all in our little home, home microcosm and you wanted to give people a sense of purpose. Um, I'm really proud of what our, our bank and many other banks did during COVID. We had a huge amount of support to the communities, um, to you know, our clients who are suffering, going through a very challenging time if they're an owner of a small business or if they're an individual. 
Um, and that human touch was really important. And it was an opportunity as a leader to try things that were very different. Also, frankly, as a, a woman, um, I think it made it easier to have a different way of connecting with our people and having a conversation with them. So I complain about the fact my son didn't know how to stack a dishwasher. And oh. you, know, you talk about other things that were human that were going on in our lives, and it made it much easier to connect to our so people. So your employees, they, they call you Jane, or what do they call you? Yes, absolutely, right. yes. Okay, they don't yes. call you Miss Razor or something no, like that? No, they do not. I'm just Jane. And that's great, because you know, it, it, they'll tell you things that way. They'll tell you what's going on. They'll tell you things that we could do to improve. They'll um, tell you funny stories. They'll tell you things they're okay. proud so about. For young professionals, yes. why should they want to work in a large commercial bank? What's the appeal of it? Why, if somebody gets, goes to Harvard Business School, why not go to a private equity firm, a hedge firm, uh, one of these you know, up important organizations? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and why, what's the, well, how do you recruit people into a place like Citi? What, what is it that you say is so great about being a commercial banker? Ah, so I look at my career um, in, within Citi. And I've worked all around the world. I've lived all around the world. I've worked in St. Louis, Missouri. I've lived in Miami and worked out of there in New York. Um, I've obviously worked around Europe, as you can tell from the accent. Um, and I've worked in all sorts of different businesses. Um, I've worked on really, really tough problems. You know, America's global banks are right in the center of some of the biggest challenges that are going on in the world geopolitically. We get pulled into the conversations. Um, we're supporting, we're playing a critical role in supporting clients and countries. Um, and you get an opportunity to come and work and learn um, in a team environment, in an apprenticeship model on how to tackle right. and solve some of these pieces. It's a privilege. I mean, it's, it's such, it truly is a privilege. It's extraordinary, um, the different uh, topics and challenges and opportunities you're pulled into. Okay. At City Now, what is the largest, most profitable part of your bank? How, how do you divide the bank into, you have it divided into consumer, four businesses. institutional? Yeah, four main businesses. So we have, our, um, we have what we call services businesses. So this is the $4 trillion a day that moves around the world. That's the GDP of Germany. Um, and that serves the, the multinational companies and also the, the new emerging digital companies that go global very quickly, so these mid-market mid -market players. So that, in a way, is almost a jewel in the crown, um, just because of the connectivity it provides and what it does for companies. Um, and that's, that grew last year almost by 33%. So it's a very fast growing That's part a low of the bank. margin business relative to others? Hard, no, very high return on tangible common equity. It's a thing of beauty. Okay. Um, it had been, <laughs> yes. Um, right, it's not available for sale, David, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, okay, then what, we have our markets business. And our markets business, most people think of trading. What, it, you know, what, what are you doing in trading? Most of our trading is, for example, helping companies hedge foreign exchange. You can imagine when Russia happened. Um, and the invasion into Ukraine and the, the horrors of what happened there. Huge amount of companies trying to work out how do I hedge my foreign exchange, what am I doing? We, we've been helping companies manage their volatility. Okay. So that's our markets business. Our investment banking business, corporate banking business, abides corporates on their lending needs, on their financing needs, and if they're in m and I'm very proud to serve your, your company in well, all of those three businesses. You were our first uh, lender, yes. uh, for sure. Thank you for your help. Um, by the way, uh, the Global Consumer Bank, yes. which you headed for a while, yes. today you announced that the current head of the Global Consumer Bank is the new chief operating officer. Yeah. So you obviously like the Global Consumer Bank, right? Well, it's a couple of different pieces. He's incredibly talented. He's been at City for 30 years, so he's worked all over the world. He needs to follow the same career path we were talking about. Um, and he's very strong um, in terms of operational skills. So when you look at who do you want at the right, on your right hand side there, you want yeah. someone who's gonna be strong at that. Um, also our global consumer business um, is changing. We're focusing on wealth and then the US business. So, so it's a different hue now. Now what about diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah. What are you doing? Obviously you get a lot of attention for this because yeah. you're a woman. What are you doing to make certain you have other uh, diversity standards yeah. met in the bank? It's, it's a really important part of the bank because I think because, because we've got people from everywhere um, who work at City and you know, they want to work for an American enterprise. Um, it, it's a real compelling point of, uh, 
of the bank um, in, a, in attracting talent from all over the world. Um, it's very attractive to women. I've never worked, I've only ever worked for American companies all of my career. Um, and it, it, so there's a, there's a huge power to this. For City, um, my predecessor really was very focused on making sure that we had strong diversity of all types in the bank. Um, and we worked out that radical transparency is very, very valuable. So we put out three-year targets on representation. Um, and we disclose those every, you know, we disclose exactly what they are. Nothing like disclosing something to make sure you pay attention to it. Um, the, the targets we have on both recruiting and in retention and in promoting Thanks. are in everybody's scorecard. And we also have pay equity. So every single year we measure, you have a third party come in and make sure that every woman is paid exactly the same as a man in the same job performing at the same level. Um, okay. And we disclose that. So, um, okay. So now currently many CEOs are under pressure to take positions on public uh, policy matters. So positions on voting rights or, or um, climate change and so mm -hmm. forth. Do you think CEOs should be getting in the middle of talking about those kind of things or do you try to not do that? Um, when they matter to your business model um, and when they're important for progress. Um, if you're a bank, you care a lot about economic growth and progress around the world. So yes, we will speak out on that. Also, if it's very important to our people, the communities that we're in, there'll be topics we'll talk about. We don't view this as being political, um, but it's, it's about what do we stand for as a bank. So for example, in, in the climate arena, we don't see energy security and investing in sustainable and new technologies as being mutually exclusive. And our job is to work on how do we help companies develop the new technology to this and also help companies ensure we've got energy security. And we work on that. We don't view okay. it as political. All right. Suppose I'm listening to what you say and I say, yeah. she's obviously articulate. She's committed. Uh, maybe I'll buy her stock. You think your stock's a good buy right now? Yes. Okay. Very. My buy it, I can get an appreciation of some percent I can be happy with, you think? Not as good as private equity returns, but good, right? <laughs> um, okay, let me ask you about <laughs> credit cards. Have you ever had your credit card, your city card denied when you go to, you know, When I it? go to buy something? Yeah, has ever happened? Yeah, I think there has been, and I've been quite grateful, because if there's been fraud, I would much rather that someone's not using my card fraudulently. Um, and that they're checking it as me. But has that ever, you so. ever been called and said somebody's using your card or they've never denied you credit because you're not paying your bills or something? That doesn't happen? Um, no, I'm Scottish, so I'm very, very diligent about making sure that I can uh, pay all my bills on time. Okay. Yes. So today, uh, what do you do for relaxation uh, to get away from the office from time to yeah. time? Are you a golfer uh, or, or something? Yeah, well, look, I, I love spending time with my kids. So, um, you know, being able to have a chance to spend some time with them. They're less enthusiastic now than they used to be when they're little about that, but I'll take what I get. Do they, um, tell, you their, they tell their friends who you are or they don't want to tell oh, them? So when I was announced as CEO, I knew it was going to happen. I called up my Duke son and I, I said, didn't pick up as usual. And I said, please call me. Um, and I get you a text called your back. son and he didn't pick up? No, 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 didn't pick up. He sent a message about, I'm, on a, I'm, a, I'm busy. I said, no, no, please, I've got some news. Could you, could you pick up? And he, he's like, mom, I'm, I mean, I'm on Zoom calls. I'm, you know, I'm really busy. And, and he did not pick up, did not pick up. I ended up having to text him the next morning that it was going to be announced. And then he came back to me at the end of the day and said, mom, you were, you know, it was a text message, it wasn't a call. I said, Mum, you know, you're all over the news today. Are you important or something? Dot, 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 <laughs> dot. <laughs> so, you know, was your, I, uh, I enjoy spending time with them. They keep, you, <laughs> keep your feet on the ground. Was your other son more responsive when you told him? Was he more responsive? Slightly, but it was marginal. Marginal. Okay. <laughs> 
So, um, but you can't work around the clock all the yeah. time, so yeah. you must have some uh, hobbies other than your children. Are you, yeah. uh, your, your son is a very good golfer. You're both your children yeah, yes. are. Are you a golfer too? I, I would probably kill someone off the first tee right now okay. with my golf game, but I used, I used to play a lot of golf. I enjoyed so. it. I love, I love traveling. I mean, you work for a global company. Um, the fascination of traveling around the world, I, I really enjoy going to new places. So what's the greatest pleasure of being the CEO of City? Oh, our people, our people and our clients. I mean, they, they, we've got people from all over the world and they've always got interesting stories as to why they join uh, you know, a global American company. Um, they've, they've usually, you know, it's taken a bit of guts in their story to come there. So right. and, and they really aspire. They, they, they believe in the American dream. They aspire for greater things. And our clients are the same. They tend to want to bank with us because of what we're able to provide them globally. And they're some of the most incredible companies okay. and entrepreneurs and innovators in the world like you, David. What's, uh, what's yeah. the biggest downside to being, what's, what's the frustration other than interviews yeah, like lack this? Of, lack of beauty sleep. Really? Okay, so you don't, you get... Uh... It's the jet lag. Now that we're back off COVID again, jet lag, I'm not, you know, I'm three years older than I was, and I definitely find the jet lag guys has taken its toll. So if the President of the United States called yeah. you, and you were, for the last 20 years, a U.S. citizen... Yes, indeed, said, uh, proudly. Uh, eventually, uh, I'm going to have a new Secretary of Treasury, and I'd like a woman to be Secretary of Treasury again. If Janet Yellen were to step down, I don't know that she is, but eventually she might. Would you like to be Secretary of Treasury? No. <laughs> really? Why? Oh, I, I, I think I'm better suited to the private sector. Um, and I, I'm, I truly, I've, I've got a lot to do, as we talked about, in my day job. Um, it's a privilege to have this job. I'm focused on this job and doing this job well. Wow. Um, okay, I don't so, need to worry about So you don't want to be Secretary things. of Treasury, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, none of those jobs, right? Yeah, I think there's some very good people in them right now. Okay, so the final message that you would like yeah. people here to have or people watching. What is the main message you would like to give to people about City, yeah. Citibank? Yeah. City's on a mission um, and we're gonna get that mission done. Um, to be a bank that America's proud of, um, that pl continues to play a very important role in the global economy um, and that its shareholders will get a very good return from. Okay, well, you can't say it better than that. I wanna yeah. thank you very much for your time. Thank you, and, uh, thank you very much.